Hello and welcome to Gardening at 58 North. So in this video I'd like to give you guys a tour of my tropical garden here. Now there's a few plants that I'll just cover briefly such as the banana plant and the paulonia. The paulonia is this one up here because I'm going to feature them much more in depth in the other videos. So in this video I'm, I'm focusing more on all the other little plants in this tropical garden and I'm also giving you a very quick tour of the rest of my garden. So this is the main tropical bed. This is the one I planted up last year but as you can see it's grown so much more than it did last year. It's getting really quite big now. The Paulonia, for example, which is this one here, the world's fastest growing tree, this is only the second year that it's grown. Last year it only grew one foot. This year it's probably grown, I'd say about two and a half meters, maybe three meters, so it's got some real height on it. And the banana trees as well, they were only about a meter tall last year, but now they're well over two meters in height. So I'll take you around to the other side of the bed where you get a bit more of an overview. So from here you should be able to see the entirety of the bed a little bit better. As you can see the bananas are the real star of the bed. The idea with this bed is I'm planting this up with my most sensitive hardy plants. So these plants they are hardy but they are really just hardy at the root level and they need a bit of extra protection if I want to keep the stems alive or if I want to keep the roots alive I even need to give them a bit of extra mulch. So the idea is I put them all here crammed in the same bed, that way I can keep it really heavily mulched, put on lots of extra layers of, of fleece or any kind of insulation I need and just have this as a really specialised bed. And then later on, when I get the rest of my garden completed, I'll have other tropical plants in this area here, but these plants will be fully hardy and they'll be fine on their own without much care and attention and all the care and attention will just be focused on this bed here. So I will very quickly talk about the bananas, as I say, I'll go into them more depth on a separate video. But the bananas here, they're mainly Musa Sikimensis bananas, these are the ones you can see. There's uh, one here and there's one just behind it there, they're just normal Musa Sikimensis. I've got a Musa Bajou, which is kind of hard to see, but it's just that you can see a rolled up leaf there and an open leaf there. And then they're the ones that I planted last year. I did lose two, or at least one died off when I transplanted it and it recovered. The other one completely died. They're all from seeds, so the genetics were slightly different. The ones that are in the bed at the moment are the biggest ones and the ones that are the hardiest. But this year I've also grown a few new ones. So this one here is called Helen's Hybrid. It's another type of Musa Sikimensis banana, but it's crossed with another banana. So it's just got a bit more hybrid vigor. And this is only a year old, or less than a year actually, because I've grown this from seed this spring. And you can see it's already the same height of these two year old plants. So that's really exciting to see. Loads and loads of growth on this one. I'm definitely looking forward to how big this will get next year if I can overwinter it. The main difference with this and the other Musa Sikimensis is it tends to have much narrower stems. It's got that kind of glaucous white bluish color on the stems as well. And it just grows a lot faster. And you can see the leaves are already quite a size. And then the only other banana I've got in here is the, the, another Musa Sikimensis hybrid. This is called Dad's Giant. You can see it's got that kind of nice Musa Sikimensis dark color underneath the leaves, which some of my Musa Sikimensis have, some of them don't but you don't really get that purpling colour on the underneath of any of the Musa Bazoo plants. You get very slight, but not to the same degree. This one is the same age as the Helen's Hybrid, but as you can see, it's a lot smaller. It's already getting pups though, which is quite surprising considering how small it is, but it's a much smaller plant. So the look I'm going for in this bed is I'm trying to go for the classic kind of tropical jungle where you have an upper canopy of tall trees. So that will be the Paulonia and that will be the banana plant. Then I'm going to have a mid canopy, which will be the hardy gingers. They're the heady chims. I'll go through them next. And then on the ground level, it's going to be a, a mixture of different ground cover plants, some taller, some smaller. At the moment, it's mainly Begonia grandis, which is a hardy type of Begonia, which I'll also show you soon. And there may be a really low growing ground cover that will completely cover the ground. So the idea is to have lots of different layers of foliage and the taller plants, they shelter the, the, the smaller ones that need a bit more shade. And they all just kind of work and work together to create a nice little microclimate where it's warm and humid and the plants will really enjoy growing together. So I'll go through all the heavy cheams now, but it will be a little bit difficult to show one of them because it's right in the middle of the bed and it's hard to get to. But I'll start off with one of my more recent heady cheams and this is my heady cheam Gardarianum. So this one I've only grown for one year. The other two I grew last year. This one is supposed to be one of the taller varieties. It did flower and if I have a photo, I'll put it up now. You can see I cut off the, the flower shoot there. There's a chance that this shoot might flower if the, the season is mild enough, but we're getting quite late in the season now. It'll be October in a week and the frost will come very soon. So we probably won't get any more flowers on this, but you can see it's done really well. 
it just started off with one weak stem. It's now got not numerous strong stems. What I will do come autumn, and same with all my other Hedychiums, is I will dig up half of them, put them in my conservatory where it's cold. They don't really grow much over winter, but they do keep all their green shoots. And then when I plant them back out in spring, they get a really good head start and they'll flower extra early and I'll make sure I have to get flowers because here in Scotland if I was just to grow them and just let them regrow from the base every year it, they probably wouldn't flower or they might just start flowering right at the end of the season and then the frost would kill them so this is the Gardarianum this one is it's got nice long leaves it's a bit similar to my Telstar 4 which I'll show you later and the stems are quite slender and it's quite tall stems but my favourite one is probably this one here and this one is a Hedychium wardii. The wardii has much thicker stems, has much bigger leaves as well. I just think it looks a little bit more tropical than the other ones just because it has those larger leaves. And this flower actually flowers a lot longer. So with the Telstar 4 and with the Gardarianum one here, what happens is you get the flower that comes out. It's covered in little pink flowers that are quite frilly. It has got quite nice fragrance as well, but the flower only lasts a few days. Even though there's probably about 10 flowers in there, they all open up at once and then they die off. That's the flowering finish. But with the wardi eye here, what happens is you get this flower bud that comes up here and out of this flower bud, it keeps sending up new flowers. And that flowered for me for almost a month, probably had 20 or 30 individual flowers. The flowers were much bigger, and much more like an orchid type of flower. And the scent was also much stronger with these as well. So that looked really great. It was originally, flowering in this stem down here but I have got this one which is trying to flower and there's one over there which is thinking of flowering so if we get a mild autumn and you can see there's also a third one there so if we get a mild autumn hopefully this will flower for me but we'll just have to wait and see but it does just say I did have some of this inside last winter so the plant to put outside had the extra early flower and that's why we had that small flower here but you can see the really nice big thick stems, really good robust plants, so I think this is my favourite hardy ginger at the moment. And to give you an example of how much better this grew when I had it kept green over the winter inside compared with the one in the summer, I was just come around here. So I actually dug up a small amount of this, the vast majority of the tuber was left in the ground. Now the tuber that was left in the ground, all it did was grow up this one shoot even though it was much bigger than the one I grew indoors and it hasn't grown any more shoots, it hasn't flowered, and it's just kind of been smothered. Basically this didn't start growing until June or July, until the warm weather had really started to come in. It just stayed dormant for too long, and it's had barely any growth. Whereas this one here, this massive plant here with all these shoots, this only had the one stem, which was this stem here that I dug up last year. It was quite small. That survived the whole winter, and it's also survived the whole summer. It then threw up this one shoot, over the late winter, early spring, which was this one here. When I put it in the ground around about May, June time, it was already in active growth. It then set up all these shoots quite vigorously and it's now become the large plant that you can see now. So definitely for the warty eye, every year I think I need to dig up the majority of the plant, overwinter it. Even though it can survive the frost when it's mulched, it takes so long to come out of dormancy when we have such cold soils here in the Scottish springtime that I really need to give that a head start. So that's the warty eye, Hedychium warty eye, my favourite Hedychium so far. And I'll show you the Telstar 4, which is right in the back. You can just about see it there. I'll see if I can get a better shot of it, but it is really in the middle of the whole jungle clump. So this is probably the best shot I can get of the Telstar 4. And this is it here. It did flower for me last year because I had overwintered some of it inside. Uh, I don't think we're going to get any flowers this year, but we've got a really nice tall stems. We've got quite strong stems as well. Now this was similar to the, the wardy eye where I had half inside, half outside. So this little clump on the right here, this was the growth that's come up from the overwintered tubers that were underground. They were quite late in growing. And then up here, these are the ones that grew a lot taller and earlier because they were already in active growth when I put them out in spring. So quite a bit of difference, but not as big a difference as a wardy eye. So with this one, I'm not too bothered if I don't dig it up in autumn. I know that it will get a decent head start and we'll still get plenty of nice looking foliage, even if I don't get flowers, if it's left over winter. But you can see it's quite a tall one. It's got much more slender leaves, very long leaves, much longer than the Gardarianum even, but it's very similar to the Gardarianum it's quite different to the the wardy eye. So I'll now show you some of the other plants that make up this bed. At the back here you can see these really tall plants. These were just put in just for a bit of backdrop to provide a bit of shelter and to add a bit of nice colour to the garden. So this is the tree spinach. I grew the tree spinach in my parents garden last year and it did so well and it grew so tall that I thought it would look quite good in the, my tropical bed and 
it doesn't really have it now but when it's younger it has these really nice purple looking shoots and you get this really nice vibrant color on the young tips so it looked really nice at the beginning of the year and now it's probably about three meters in height it's just got that nice backdrop to the garden and it's just helping to break the wind a little bit so what I probably will do is I'll cut this back before it sets seed because once it sets seed it does, set, it does send its seeds everywhere and it can become a bit like a weed so I'll be taking that out before the seeds are set on that one and along the back there if I pan down you'll see I do have some cannas last year I planted about 10 varieties varieties of cannas. None of them did very well for me. They all struggled. Some of them have survived the winter such as this one here. So I did plant my tallest ones at the back and you can actually see there's some flowers starting. So if we get a few mild weeks we might get some nice flowers on this canna. And there's a few more as I say kind of dotted around. Kind of hard to see. You can see there's one right at the back there. That's another one that's supposed to be quite tall but that's a bit smothered at the moment. And then just towards the front here I have got some more again very smothered. The only one you can really see is probably that purple leaf right in the middle. But I find the cannas, they just don't do well at all for me. They did really bad their first summer, didn't grow well at all, and a lot of them didn't overwinter. The reason I didn't take them inside to overwinter is because they grew so badly for me in the first summer, I thought I wasn't really going to bother with them. I think here in Scotland, the weather is just a bit too cold for them. The bananas are fine because they're from really high up areas in the Himalayas, same with the heady chiams, so they're used to cooler temperatures in the summer but I just haven't found yet a good variety of canna. I, as I said, I tried 10 different varieties last year. None of them have done too well, apart from that one at the back, but I might try some new ones in the future. Hopefully I can find some that would do well in this bed, but so far the cannas haven't been a huge success, so I'll probably slowly take them out eventually, unless that one at the back really takes off and, and does well every year. And so as we come down further into the canopy, we have the main ground cover. So this year, as is last year, is the Begonia grandis. That's this plant here. It grows about one or two foot in height. It is surprisingly for a Begonia fully hardy. This variety is called Sapporo, so it's from the northern island of Japan and it's supposed to be even slightly hardier than some of the other Begonia grandis plants. It's, I mainly grow it because it's just so unusual to see a Begonia plant that's hardy can grow outside because, no, because normally you think of Begonias as a house plant. So I normally have it for the foliage, which is quite nice. It's not as, as sunny as some Begonias, it doesn't have any kind of white patterning, but it does have that nice kind of red colour underneath. And the flowers are just a small bonus in, in autumn time but the flowers only come up right at the end of the season before the frosts come and to be honest they're not very showy flowers they're quite small so they just add a small splash of colour into the bed but I do like the Begonia grandis I started off with about 10 plants last year you can see that's what these big clumps are now they died down but they set these little bulbules off their stems now I don't think there's many bulbules that you can see at the moment the bulbules come right at the end of the season just before the frost arrived so last year we had a very late frost so it was really until November the frost came and killed this and because this is underneath the canopy of the other plants it really gets protected from the frost so this does survive till quite late in the year and that's when the bulbules form so that's why there's none to sow at the moment but the main plant as I say forms a large tuber I'll show you a photo of one I had from last year that's fully really hardy underground and survives then along the stems the bulbules are form tiny little tiny little um, little bulbs and that's what these little plants coming down the bottom here are these tiny little leaves and there'll be a few of them dotted all over the bed some very small begonia plants so this is going to slowly spread as I say there's about 10 dotted around anyway some of them are a bit taller and leggier because they're like that in the dark shade other ones are in the in direct sunshine but they seem to be very adaptable they seem to be fine with the bright sunshine in bright sunshine they just grow very bushy with lots of leaves like that whereas the ones that grow in the deep shade they just get a little bit leggier so i'm very happy with how the begonia grandis is done and what i might try and do in the future is try and get a few cross pollinations done with it with some other more ornamental begonias such as this one here this is the tuberous begonia which isn't hardy but it's got much bigger more interesting flowers i put a few in here just to kind of fill a few spaces and I might try and cross pollinate them in the future, see if I can get a hardy begonia with maybe more interesting leaves but definitely with some bigger flowers and hopefully some earlier flowering uh, varieties as well because as I say begonia grandis flowers so late in the year I don't really see many of the flowers 
Whereas these tuberous begonias, they flower much earlier and they keep going on for a long time. So that's all the plants that I've got on, planted in mass. Uh, there is the paulonia as well, which I will go into more detail in another video at the end of the year, just to show you how much it has grown. What I'll probably do with the paulonia is I'll cut it down to the ground every year. That encourages it to grow these giant leaves and it just has that really interesting jungle appearance. If it to grow, it would grow into a giant tree, which wouldn't be suitable for this bed, but also the leaves would get much smaller and wouldn't get that nice jungle appearance. So there are a few individual plants I'd like to show you now. So this here is my Xanthelesia hercules. It's not doing anywhere as near as well this year. We had a very dry summer. I think that's part of the problem. It likes quite wet soil, so it struggled as it was quite a dry summer. The other problem I had is I dug it up in winter. I divided it into lots of different bulbs and I put the largest one back in here. So it's a lot smaller, the plant, than it was last year because of that. And I don't think I've got any flower buds coming up, so we probably won't get any flowers this, this autumn. But next year we should. And this is basically just a type of calla lily, but the flowers are much bigger than normal, the leaves are much bigger than normal, and it can grow up to one to two meters in height in perfect conditions. So I do really like this. The leaves, like I say, will get much bigger. You've got this lovely white flex on it, so even when it doesn't flower, it looks really nice. But when the flowers come in, absolutely stunning. I had ones last year, and the flower stalks were over a meter in size. They just looked so large and unusual that it didn't really look like it was a, a, a the scale of it was just out of this world. And then over here, I've got my Trachycarpus fortunii. This here, I've made sure I planted it at least a meter away from any of the larger plants, such as the paulonia and the banana trees, because when this grows up, it could easily be about two meters in, in width. Now this will be a very slow growing plant, and this will be the only evergreen thing that will be here in the winter time. Everything else will be heavily mulched and, and protected, but this is fully hardy. You can easily take minus 50, possibly minus 20, without too much damage. It's a very slow growing palm. As I say, it looks completely smothered now, but for most of the summer, it does have to get full sunlight all spring time. And then for the midsummer, it gets dappled shade. And then right about this time of year, it gets smothered. But that will slowly grow, very slow growing palm. Eventually, it could easily get two or three times the height of that polonia but it will take a long time to do it and we'll just have to see how it grows over the years. So probably the rarest plant I've got in this bed is this plant here. So this is a Nicandra maxima. So there's another plant called a souffle plant called Nicandra physaloides, which I've grown a lot in the past, which has similar looking leaves, but has really nice blue flowers and black specks on the leaves. And it's a really nice unusual looking plant. You, often you can use the dried seed heads for flower arranging. I've grown that for years, but this is an unusual one because the Nicandrophyceloides is not too uncommon, even though it is an unusual plant. You can grow it as an annual, and quite often you, you can see it dotted around in some people's gardens as an annual plant for its nice flowers and its dried seed heads. This here is actually supposed to be more of a perennial. It's supposed to be like a shrub. Now, I don't ever expect this to survive my winters. Although it comes from the Andes Mountains, up at around 2,000 meters in height, so it can handle some cooler, colder temperatures. It can't really handle any frost, so I suspect once the frost comes, this will die. But the idea with this plant is it has really, really big leaves. The leaves haven't caught quite to the maximum size yet. They will get a bit bigger. And the leaves are much bigger on this than they are on the Nicandra physaloides. Also, the, the souffle plant, Nicandra physaloides, that doesn't grow a huge amount taller than what this is now and a good year get close to two meters but this can get up to three meters maybe even more as it is a, a small shrub and the flowers be much bigger on it as well now it's just starting to have some flower buds i, I bought 10 seeds and uh, not many of them germinated and the ones that did two or three died off they i overwatered them and they rotted this was the only one that survived so i'd really like this one to set seed this autumn so i can collect the seeds and grow it again next year now there is a little flower bud starting there, so I'll see how that does. Hopefully that will do okay, and hopefully it will set seed and I can grow this again next year. But it's an unusual plant, especially when you consider that I planted this quite late. I think it was about July time, and it's put on all that growth in the last month or so. So if I planted this at the correct time of year, and I had it out nice and early in early spring, this could probably get to the height of the bananas, two or three meters in height in one season. So. Looking forward to growing this again next year, but hopefully I'll get the timings a bit better. So coming along a few other plants, this one here is actually a very common plant that a lot of you will know. This is Alstroemeria. So I don't actually like the taller Alstroemerias or the older varieties. The old varieties can be quite invasive. They're quite tall. And they often have a good flowering display and then it's finished once it's finished flowering. But there's a lot of these new modern hybrids now, which are really small compact plants. Don't tend to be as, in as invasive as the old varieties. And they also flower continuously from spring right into the first frosts. So what this does is it sends up lots of little short shoots. You can see there's an old one here, another old one there. And then some new ones coming out with flowers. 
this will just keep setting up new shoots, keep flowering constantly, and it has that really nice kind of tropical appearance to the flowers. So not a very unusual plant, fully hardy, but it just looks really nice and I think it fits in with the tropical design. Coming around here, we have another plant which is a bit like that. That's the Hoytunia. I put this in just this year, so it's a very small plant. You can just see it down here. This has fantastic coloured leaves. They're fading a bit now because it's autumn and it's a bit shaded, but this had fantastic kind of multicoloured leaves, really vibrant colours. This grows as a ground cover. Now it can be a bit invasive. I'm not too worried here because it doesn't grow very tall, so it shouldn't really overshadow any other plants. It will just spread and form a nice ground cover to the, to the bed. And if we have a mild winter, it can sometimes be evergreen, so it could give me a bit of colour over winter. But this is just to give me some colour early on in the season when everything is still quite bare. And then maybe at the end of the season when the, the first frosts come and opens up the bed again, I'll get a bit of colour on the ground. And it's just to give me a bit of a ground cover. It does have small flowers, but they're nothing terribly exciting. But I think it looks quite tropical with the, 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 the shape of the foliage. So I do quite like this one. Let's see how it does. So a few other plants have got dotted around here as, as kind of ground cover are the Oxalis triangularis here. Now these are actually normally grown as house plants, but if you keep them well mulched, the bulbs, bulbs can actually survive a winter in, in the ground okay. And these actually did really well last year. I just had a few bulbs, I separated them out, the plants clumped up to a good size and this year they did absolutely fantastically until this rust came. So this is Oxalis rust, it's basically destroyed all the leaves, all the foliage has died back. You can tell its appearance because it has these bright orange kind of patterning on them. Most of it's kind of died down now, it's not as bad as it was but it, was, it has this bright orange colour when it's active and it's just destroyed the lovely purple leaves that this has. So there's another one here which was actually an even bigger plant that was destroyed and this was uh, hit earlier which is why it's looking even smaller but it was looking amazing i'll show you some photos as well what it did look like lovely big purple leaves and it has these nice pink flowers so i do like this plant but i'll just have to see how it does in the coming years if this oxalis rust keeps coming back that could be a problem i might have to replace it with something else which isn't susceptible to the oxalis rust but it's the same so it did look so nice and it was growing so well there's a few more dotted inside the bed the ones that were more sheltered actually did better and they didn't seem to get as much rust. They didn't grow as big or as large because they were not getting enough sunlight but the plants themselves didn't get the rust so they, they've survived a bit longer. So I'll come round and I'll show you that the last, one of the last large plants to show you in this bed, that's the Insetti Ventricosum here. This is a, again, it's a bit like a banana plant so I won't talk about it too much. I'll let you watch my other video all about banana trees but this is not hardy at the root so I have to take this in every winter and overwinter it as a as a just like a stem and, and a corm. So that's the Insetti Venticosum, really done very well this year. And then right around the side here, this is my biggest um, castor oil plant. Now if I've got the time, I want to make a video about all my other castor oil plants, go into them in a bit more detail. And I did show you them in a previous video, but this variety is Zanzarensis, so it's Ricinus communis Zanzarensis and it just has much bigger leaves and with a slight bluish tint to them. This one isn't a pure form, so it does have red stems. They should have more of a bluey green stem, but you can see the size of the leaves, absolutely huge. My hands aren't good for scale because I'm six foot five, but you can see they're really big, really big leaves. Almost looks like a tetrapanix, they're so large. And this has grown up with one main stem and then it's starting to throw off all these side shoots now. You can see them growing up there and further back. And it is starting to flower now, so I'm kind of hoping that it sets seed. The seeds don't look like they're far enough advanced for it to actually set seed this year. We'll just have to see what happens. As I do have another Zanzibarensis, but that didn't grow anywhere near as well. And this one seems to have particularly good genetics. So I'd like to collect the seed from this if I can, but we'll just have to see how it does because it is getting a bit far on in the year. And then this year as an underplanting, partly because of the food the cost of food was so high and also because I had space, I planted some courgette plants and also some butternut squash. So this is one of the courgettes. It's just starting to get powdery mildew, which always happens at this time of year. There's not much I can do about that. The temperatures are getting colder. It's going to die off anyway. Even if the mildew doesn't kill it, the cold temperatures will kill it soon. But we've, got, we've been getting really good crop of courgettes. You can see there's plenty down there and I'll just keep cropping them. And then a much bigger plant, which is kind of scattered throughout the whole bed. It's kind of hard to sow back there, but the majority of it is at the front here. And that's the butternut squash, which is growing really well. And now I don't know if it's sunny enough for it to get any ripe butternut squash on it for me to harvest, but it's a nice kind of tropical looking vine. So that's doing nicely. And it'll be interesting to see if we do get any harvest off that this year. So that's the main tropical bed anyway. I'm doing really well this year, really quite grown out. We'll see how it does 
as the uh, years go by. I'll probably make a video maybe later on when I'm insulating it, getting it ready for winter, to show you how that process works. And I'll be interested to see how much growth this puts on. I might do another tour of some of the other plants later, as I say, if the weather continues to be quite good. Last year it was exceptionally mild. There was a few light frosts which I managed to protect this with a giant horticultural fleece. This year that might not be possible. Last year it was only a metre in height. This year, as you can see, it's about three metres in height, so it's a lot more difficult for me to protect it from any frost. But as I say, last year a couple of light frosts that I managed to protect it from. We didn't get a hard frost until late November, so it did really, really well. And so hopefully this year we'll see. If it's another mild autumn, we might get another month or two's growth. But as the temperatures get so cold and the light levels are so low here in this part of the world, I'm not expecting a huge amount of growth, even if we don't have frost for another two months. So I will give you a very quick tour of the rest of the garden whilst I'm out. So this section here isn't finished yet, so I've just kind of had it as a nursery area. And I've let a pumpkin plant kind of sprawl across it just to give me a little bit of pumpkin crop. I did plant two or three more pumpkin plants, but the, the slugs killed them. I had hoped to get the whole thing covered in pumpkins, but only one plant survived. The idea is here, as I say earlier in the video, is I'll be planting this up with tropical looking plants and plants that I just like the look of, but ones that are fully hardy and they won't need a lot of attention to look after them. And then in the background, you can see the studio shed. I've built the outside of it, but the inside I'll have to wait until I save up some more money and I'll get the inside of the studio shed, shed built. But my idea for this is on the outside, I'm going to put up some kind of wires and that'll be covered in passion flowers. So they'll be climbing up there. The idea is the studio shed will disappear. There'll be all these plants around it and climbing up it. You won't even know it's there in the garden. It'll just blend into the background. So I'll show you some of the plants around here. So you can see we've got, I've got one of those Xanthidesia Hercules. And this one's actually starting to flower. You can see there's a little flower shoot coming up there. So despite this being a lot smaller than the mother plant, it's already thinking of flowering. That's just one of the, the many divisions I made of it earlier this year. In this main area, we've got the pumpkin plant. It got really badly attacked by thrips, so it's, it's pretty much dying back now. And I'm suspecting the powdery mildew will appear soon. But we've got four pumpkins, so I'm quite happy we'll get some nice pumpkins to eat. This variety is a very early maturing variety with very small pumpkins, so you can see they are only tiny. If it was a bigger variety, I'd have probably one giant pumpkin, but because this is a variety that grows lots of small ones, I've got four smaller pumpkins, which, to be honest, when it comes to eating them, is a lot easier for me. There's no way I can eat an entire giant pumpkin within a few days, whereas with this size of pumpkin, I can make a nice dish out of it, and then the other ones will stay in good condition until I cut them open and need to use them. So, as I say, this is kind of like a nursery area. I've got all my Insetti Venticosa Morelli here, with this lovely kind of dark foliage. I'm not sure how I'm going to overwinter them all yet and I'll probably do some kind of planting for them next year. I've also made a few videos about their propagation and I'll put a link in for them if you want to see how I did that. I've also got my Tetrapanix down here. So this is my Tetrapanix papyrifera. I'm not sure where this is going but probably somewhere on the left hand side of this bed just to give some nice kind of dramatic leaves. I've not planted it yet because I'm not sure how invasive its roots are and also I'm not ready to plant in this part of the garden. Basically I'm waiting until I can save up enough money to buy the compost. In my part of Scotland there's a real shortage of cheap compost so it costs a fortune to get the, the ground dug over and put good compost in. So I'm composting my own compost in a compost pile out there and I'm just gonna wait a while and then hopefully next year I'll be ready to get the rest of this bed planted up. On the left here, I've got my Christmas tree that I, I use year after year. I've got my Rhododendron Cino Grande hybrid. So I was looking for a Rhododendron Cino Grande because of the giant leaves, the tropical appearance. This has got some Cino Grande genetics in it, but I don't actually know what it is. It, it came from a mountainside in Scotland when it was a young seedling and it crossed uh, pollinated with lots of other Rhododendrons. So I don't know the genetics, but this is doing okay. It's in a giant pot at the moment, but that'll be put roughly where it is now in the ground when it's ready. I've also got my two uh, bamboos that I grew from seed. These are Fargesias. I don't know the species because I just collected them from a garden that I was looking after and when, when the bamboo flowered and died. I'll be going into these in a lot more detail and my other bamboos in a special bamboo video later on this year. And then I've got these gunneras here. I've got three gunneras. I wasn't originally going to have any in my garden because they get so big, they kind of take over with the leaves. But they were going they were going for one pound each, so I couldn't resist them. So I got them as tiny offcuts in spring with no leaves and no roots, just tubers. I planted them up. They really struggled. And then once they got the roots established in late summer, they've just taken off. They've got nice large leaves. So these will be going permanently in the garden somewhere. 
I just need to decide where about they'll go because their leaves are so big, they, as I say, they do take up a lot of space. And then over here, I've got all my Paulonia trees at the back. I'll be making a specific video about them soon. They're all the ones that grew from seed and they're all slightly different with their genetics. They're all the same age as that one that's in the bed, in the ground, but because they weren't in the ground, their roots are constricted, they haven't grown anywhere near as big. The thing coming down here, I've got a slightly more unusual plant. So this is a Lomatia ferugenia. So this is from Chile. This is an unusual plant. It does actually like quite cold, cool climates like Scotland. It might not be the most hardy of, of trees, but it should be okay on coastal areas in Scotland. And we get minus 15 here, so we'll get a bit of damage every now and again, but it should survive most winters. But what's interesting with it is it's such an unusual looking plant. It's got this amazing kind of fern-like foliage. I could technically maybe grow tree ferns where I am, but they just cost so much at the moment, the prices have gone insane. And if I get a hard winter and it dies, it's such a lot of money to spend on a plant that might just die in the winter. So I'm gonna grow this instead with that kind of nice uh, ferny foliage. These leaves get much bigger than this as well, so it'll look even more like a tree fern as it gets older. As I say, it's not a real substitute for a tree fern, but it has that kind of a foliage on it. And it has this nice kind of furry stem as it grows. So that's uh, another interesting one I'm gonna grow at the back of my garden. Then we've got a few more bananas that I grew from seed. This one at the back is actually a uh, Musa Bazoo, which I just divided from my main plant in the bed. So that wasn't grown from seed, but these other two were. This one at the front here is a Daz Giant, like the one I showed you in the bed previously. This one here is another Musa Sequimensis hybrid, but it's just really struggled. I don't think it likes the cold climate here in Scotland. Basically what I was doing is I was trying to grow as many bananas as I could that I knew were supposed to be hardy, see which ones grow best in my climate, and then keep those ones. So this one is a Musa uh, Sequimensis hybrid called Paradisia, and it's just really struggled that one. And coming along, it's a bit weedy at the moment, needs to do a bit of, a bit of maintenance, but you can see I've got my Tusquia gigantea bamboo here. Again, I'm gonna go into a lot more detail with this in another video. And we've got one of the, the Sequimensis plants which survived the winter, but really struggled. The main stem rotted off, and all that came up with this offshoot, so. I need to keep that somewhere a bit more sheltered this winter and decide where eventually I'm going to plant that. And then finally, the last bit of the back garden here is the bamboo area. So I've got some giant sweet corn as well, which um, if I have the time, I hope to make a video about again. It's done okay for considering the Scottish climate, but, but not fantastic. As you can see, it's only about two and a bit meters in height. So a lot smaller than the five meters that it could potentially grow to in the right climate. But this is the bamboo area, as I say. So we've got a few different types of bamboo. I won't go into much detail about them because I'm going to make a dedicated update on all my bamboos later this year. But we've got the Phyllostachys Oros Ocata Spectabilis here, which has grown really well. And I've got my seed grown Phyllostachys edulis, also known as Moso bamboo, which is shooting up with these six foot stems. So I'll give you guys an update on these in another video so I can keep this one a little bit shorter. And then planted around them is some normal sweet corn plants, some more giant sweet corn, and then a mixture of dwarf beans, butternut squash, you can actually see there's a little one there just starting to ripen up, and also some courgette plants as well, and a few spare begonia grandis that I have lying around. So that's all for this video, and I'll finish off the video here in the front garden. Now I will be giving you guys an update on this later on in the year, if we have a mild autumn and the flowers are still looking good. I did do a recent update probably about a month ago. There wasn't quite as much in flower. And as I say, if we have a mild winter and, and the flowers keep doing well and the giant sunflower keeps getting bigger and bigger, I'll give you guys an update on this. But I just wanted to show you this uh, as part of this video because I've got a few tropicals. You can see I've got the, the Insetti Venticosum there and a few riceness plants as well. But hopefully I'll give you guys an update if the storm coming this weekend isn't too bad. I'll give you guys an update in a few weeks time and show you how the front garden's doing. But that's all for now and the next update on the tropical garden will probably be either a winter going to bed video where I'm cutting it back and insulating everything or it'll be springtime when I'm waking everything up again getting it ready for next year's growth.